somebody took my in my uh, hand sanitizer. Oh, it's down here. Somebody's trying to hide. It was like my mom coming in here to clean up or something. Oh, we all have our routines. We got to stick with the routine. Got to get the hand sanitizer. All right, well, uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this press briefing with regard to the state's response to the coronavirus pandemic. As always, we remind people, please continue to take all the precautions that we've been taking to slow down the spread of the virus. That while our hospitalizations are down, 421, lowest level in nearly three months, it's still a high level of hospitalizations, right? We would need to have this number cut in half to get down to the levels of hospitalizations we were in September. So we need people to continue to make sure they keep that six foot of distance between themselves and other people when they go to public, wear a mask when you go to the store, wash your hands often for 20 seconds at a time, that kills the virus. Stay home when you're sick, that's important just to make sure you're not spreading the virus. Certainly go get tested to see if you've got coronavirus or not, but if you've got the same sort of symptoms, uh, you know, that coronavirus has, like that cough or fever, please stay home so that if you do have coronavirus, you're not spreading it out there. And as we've talked about, there's new variants out there that may transmit more easily. So again, it's really important to follow that rule about staying home if you've got those symptoms of fever, cough, and so forth. So please continue to do that. Uh, I mentioned hospitalizations are down. Our uh, hospital bed capacity is at 30%. Our ICU bed capacity is at 32%. Our ventilator capacity is at 76%. Another way that people can continue to help fight the pandemic is by getting tested. Test Nebraska has delivered nearly 630,000 tests. Uh, we're still getting quick turnaround times at 24 to 48 hours. So please continue to take advantage of Test Nebraska. It's free. Uh, it's available to everybody. You can go sign up, uh, look for a schedule, uh, lots of availability. All right, also uh, three Cs. This is another way to help spread the, uh, prevent the spread of the virus by avoiding close contacts, crowded places, enclosed spaces. Especially in the wintertime, it's tough to get that good ventilation. So avoiding the three Cs will also help slow down the spread of the virus. And if you can't avoid the three Cs, that's when you can you wear your mask and all that other good stuff. All right, so today we got a, we're going to do a couple of updates. Um, uh, one, we're going to do a vaccine update. So Angie Ling, who's our incident commander, for the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services is going to be here to talk about that. And then we're going to be also, uh, we had our website down, the dashboard down for maintenance earlier this week. And our chief data strategist, Ashley Newmeyer, uh, also from the Department of Health and Human Services, is going to be coming up and talking a little bit about what you're going to be seeing in the dashboard going forward with regard to um, some of the changes we're going to make there. Uh, with regard to vaccinations, uh, again, what we're, where we are generally here in the state, is that we have administered 121,000 uh, vaccinations. 101,000 of those are the first dose vaccination. And uh, we are, uh, Angie will talk a little bit more about that. We're in phase 1A in um, five or four of our counties, uh, 15 of our, I'm sorry, four of our public health districts. In 15 of our public health districts, we have moved into phase 1B. So phase 1B includes hitting that 75-year-old or uh, higher in age bracket. And then also the CDC made changes for the 65-year-old or older. And so I've talked to all of our public health districts about making that a priority as they move into phase 1B. That as we reviewed our mortality data from last year, we saw a big jump between the 45 to 64-year-olds where, and these are preliminary numbers, but uh, where we had about 56 uh, fatalities per 100,000 to over 500 deaths per 100,000 when you hit that 65-year-old and older category. So I've asked all the public health districts to really prioritize getting that 65-year-old or category. Now, some districts, for example, like Central Health District, have started with the older folks. They started at 90 years old, for example, and are working their way down. That's perfectly appropriate. Again, the older you are, the more vulnerable you are. And I really asked all those health districts to really focus 90% of their vaccines on that older category. So what this means is they will have discretion with regard to uh, some of the other uh, th people that we have in phase 1B, but really focusing 90% on that uh, 
population that's going to be 65 years or older as a way to be able to get to the people who are going to be most at risk. So that's where we are with regard to our vaccines. I do expect two of the public health director uh, districts to move into phase 1B next week, and then Douglas and Lancaster uh, are likely to move into phase 1B in the first week of February. So with that, I'm going to call up uh, Angie Ling, who's going to give us a little bit more details about the vaccine program. And uh, uh, Angie, bring us up to date. Good morning. Our Vaccinate Nebraska mission continues. We have had a small increase in our allocations this week and received 11,700 doses of Pfizer and 11,800 doses of Moderna, which is an increase by 600 doses a week. We continue to receive our second doses at the proper intervals and did receive a large shipment of about 46,000 second doses late last week. Our federal pharmacy program continues with over 428 facilities receiving their first doses and second dose clinics starting this week. We anticipate all long-term care facilities receiving their first dose prior to the end of the month. To date, we have allocated 46,800 primary doses and 35,100 second doses. After next week, all doses to the federal pharmacy program will be completed. Let's take a minute to talk about numbers and a potential timeline. As of last night's dashboard update, 219,000 vaccines have been distributed in Nebraska. This number includes 89,000 that has been allocated to the federal pharmacy program leaving 130,000 to the state to allocate. Due to the way the federal pharmacy program is required to report to the federal government, there is a couple week lag in their information hitting our immunization system, and currently we are only digitally tracking about 24,000 doses administered. This is a deficit of 65,000 from distributed to administered numbers on our dashboard. Other considerations in the past week we have received 46,000 second doses that due to the proper administration interval, were only able to be started this week to administer. We have also been receiving 23,500 primary doses over this week. As I've mentioned before, all vaccine product and ancillary kits need to be in hand before partners are able to vaccinate. The folks receiving vaccine product first doses are required to get it in arms within one week. Some healthcare facilities do require slightly longer period of time to administer due to the need to stagger their staff appropriately, and we are working closely with them on plans. As many of you are hearing, we are close to the entire state moving into phase 1B. At this time, 15 health departments are vaccinating the 1B population. Two health departments will start 1B next week, and Douglas County and Lincoln Lancaster will be transitioning to 1B in the first week of February. As the governor mentioned, the priority of phase 1B will be the age 65 and older and those with high risk medical conditions identified by the CDC. There will be multiple ways to get vaccinated, including community vaccination clinics, healthcare providers, and select pharmacies. The local health departments have worked closely with current COVID vaccine providers to establish a plan for vaccinating their phase 1B population. Each jurisdiction will handle things as appropriate for their communities. Many consider considerations need to be made, including proper storage and handling, proper and timely data entry, and meeting the needs of the community. The Moderna vaccine ships in a minimum shipment of 100 doses, while the Pfizer product ships in a minimum of 975 doses. With our current allocations of approximately 94,000 a month, we calculate the 1B population to be approximately 500,000 people. Using 75% uptake for a planning factor, it would take approximately four months to get through phase 1B. Of course, we hope that greater than 75% will receive the vaccine, but this is what we are using for planning. The vaccine registration and administration system will go live next week with a tentative launch date of January 28th. We will have a, our chief information officer here next week to explain the system in more detail. All of the local health departments have a registration system currently. If you have already registered on their website, you do not need to re-register on the state system. If you are unable to register online, please give us a call at the COVID information line at 402-552-6645 or toll free 833-998. 2275, which opens seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. 
and we will assist you with registration, questions, or concerns. Residents with comorbidities may be vaccinated at community clinics. However, we highly recommend discussing the vaccine with your healthcare provider prior, prior to getting vaccinated. With our current, oh, we have heard Pfizer and Moderna may be increasing production and there may also be an additional vaccine product on the horizon. So we do hope that our allocations will increase, which will also increase our timeline moving forward. Many of you ask, have asked how allocations are determined. For phase 1B, we allocated based on healthcare staff counts and also the additional long-term care facilities that did not fall under the federal pharmacy program. Now that we are moving into phase 1B, the allocations will be population-based using the phase 1B population of 65 and older and critical infrastructure workers. Starting the week of January 25th, the local health districts will be receiving a consistent allocation each week, which will allow partners to schedule more in advance. We are very happy to see so many Nebraskans eager to be vaccinated, and we look forward to serving everyone. Thank you. Thanks, sir. All right, thanks, Angie. Now I'm governor, so I get to do this. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple questions. So you said if you already registered, like on Douglas County, if you already registered on their website, you don't need to register on the state's website when we get that up and running. And by the way, we'll have more information on that next week. Uh, what happens if you do? What happens if I decide I just want to cover my bases and I register both Douglas and, and the state? Does it? We will do duplicate that, so it will not matter. Correct. Okay, great. And then uh, also, just with regard to increased production, uh, we have reached out, for example, to Pfizer, and uh, they are not. First of all, all their production is going to the federal government, so it really is the federal government who will be allocating our vaccine doses to us, and I don't believe that we are going to see an increase in production, uh, at least in the near term. When I say the near term, like over the course at least the next month. So I think that the allocation we're getting right now we can plan on for at least the next month, which is what uh, Angie was talking about with all the local health districts. They're going to be getting that consistent supply. Uh, we've been getting consistent supply of the second doses as well, so that will just be what we're going to plan on as we move through phase 1B. So obviously we do hope at some point in the future we see more vaccine, that there's increased production, but we're not likely to see that. And then uh, also I believe, uh, this was this is a little over a week ago, we were uh, given the information that, uh, that Johnson Johnson with their Janssen project would be uh, seeking the FDA approval for the emergency use authorization perhaps in March. So obviously that's at least um, seven weeks away. So we've, or rather five weeks away. So we've still got some time before we'd even know more about that. And so again, that's not going to be impacting us over the course of the next month or so as we get into phase 1B. So again, we got a pretty consistent comply, supply. We're gonna continue to, to work the phase 1B population, which will start with, again, 90% of that going to those folks who are 65 years or older. So that is the vaccine update. Uh, next, we're going to go into the dashboard update. So I mentioned that we had uh, maintenance on. Uh, the dashboard was down for maintenance this week. Ashley Newmeyer, our chief data strategist, is going to come and talk about some of the changes we're going to be making to the dashboard. Uh, one of the things we, she's, that are not going to be in these new rollouts, but that we are looking to do is uh, to address kind of what Angie was talking about with regard to what our numbers look like with regard to getting those vaccines out. So for example, when we get 44,000 second doses late last week, we can't actually employ those um, you know, until their time is ready. And so we're going to find ways to do a better job of representing that on our dashboard. That's not what Ashley's going to be talking about, but we are going to be looking for, for ways to be able to get uh, people more information with regard to where we are in vaccines. But having said that, Ashley, I'll call you, have, ask you to come up and talk a little bit about what our new dashboard is going to look like. Yes, thank you, Governor, for the opportunity to provide an update on the COVID-19 case dashboard. So earlier this week, we moved our COVID-19 case dashboard offline for maintenance. This was to conduct a data validation and cleanup process due to a vendor lab data transmission issue that resulted in duplications. The issue has since been resolved through process improvement steps. As we continue to make improvements to our data reporting, there are also a few upcoming changes to the dashboard that I want to highlight. These changes will go into effect on the morning of Friday, January 29th, so next Friday. The COVID-19 daily positive cases and tests, um, which is displayed in this lower left-hand corner, 
will change from using the lab report date to the specimen collection date. The specimen collection date is the date that the swab is collected. Posting positive cases and tests by this date will offer a more accurate view of the number of positive cases at the time the person's test was collected. The previous graphs, or the current graphs displayed now, but will change next Friday, were posted by lab report date, which is also a common date to use, but can be affected by data processing artifacts, such as long lab turnaround times. This change in COVID-19 positive cases and tests will offer an improved data visualization to the public. The timing of the dashboard post will also change. It will post in the morning around 9 a.m. This will allow the data processing cycle to capture any lab results that were submitted after the close of business on the preceding day. So the morning update will display a midnight to midnight view of positive cases and tests for the prior day. The last evening update will occur next Wednesday evening, January 27th. When these new graphs are posted, you may notice a shift in the curve of the daily case counts. The reason for this is the difference in the day those positive tests were collected and the day they were processed through and reported to our public health surveillance system. There will also be a preliminary data period of the most recent seven days noted on, this, on the graphs. This is to highlight that as more labs are reported to us, the most recent couple days may shift. In summary, the changes to the COVID case dashboard that will launch next Friday, January 29th are timing of the dashboard update will move to the morning instead of the evening, COVID-19 daily ca case and test graph will be by specimen collection date instead of lab, re lab report date, and there will be a historical refresh of these graphs. Thank you, Governor, for the opportunity to provide this update as we continue to work to, to keep Nebraska's, Nebraskans informed. All right, thank you, Ashley. So does that mean next Thursday night, because usually we typically do the updates at night, but next Thursday night there will be no update. So don't look for an update Thursday night. It would occur, so the last update, then next week will be Wednesday night, and then again Friday morning. Okay, great. So that would be the plan for the updates for that. Uh, let's see, what else? Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Ashley. appreciate you updating us on the dashboard. Uh, also, I just wanted to make a comment that I was at the uh, inaugura inauguration uh, this past week. I thought uh, President Biden struck the right tone with regard to bringing the country together and unity. And I hope that he uses his influence with the Congress because they're not going that direction with uh, you know, proceeding on the impeachment trial or the impeachment um, charges, uh, which I think just brings disunity. And then of course today it was announced, or I read the news story that uh, Senate Democrats were charging Senators Cruz and Hawley with ethics violation. Again, this seems to me to create more divisiveness, not healing or unity. And what the Congress ought to be doing is looking at how they can assure the public of the integrity of the voter process. I mean, there's a number of Americans who have questions about the, the voting process. I don't have any questions about our process here in Nebraska. We did a very good job here. But I think Congress could benefit from uh, creating a commission that would look into this so that everybody would know that we had a free and fair election and have that assurance for the next elections going forward as well. Uh, an upcoming schedule for the next week will be 10 a.m. on Monday and 10 a.m. on Friday. On Wednesday, the Revenue Committee will be having a meeting on um, LB22CA, and so that will be, uh, the hearing will start at 9.30, and so I will be in that hearing to support the introduction of that constitutional amendment to limit how much property taxes can go up in a given year. And with that, we'll get into some questions and answers. Uh, Jay Shatara from NTV, with President By uh, Biden scraping the XL Keystone Pipeline, Keystone XL Pipeline, what does that mean for Nebraskans? How will it hurt and or help Nebraskans, and specifically geared to those who were worried about the Ogallala Aquifer and some of the effects it could potentially have had on our state? So I think this is a, a terrible decision that, uh, specifically when we're talking about the state of Nebraska, uh, the Keystone Pipeline we projected would create about 1,000 jobs when it was going to be constructed. And some of these jobs are really highly specialized welding jobs that pay like $135 an hour or $150 an hour. I mean, these are really good jobs, union jobs, that would have been created here in Nebraska while they were building that pipeline. So obviously, we're going to be missing out on those jobs being created here. 
Uh, we're also going to be missing out on the property taxes that would be paid by the pipeline if it ends up not being built because there will be no property then to tax, and so those counties will miss out on that opportunity to be able to lower everybody else's property taxes by the property taxes that would have been collected from the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, with regard to the environmental issues, this was going to be the safest pipeline ever. And a couple of scenarios here. One, the oil still moves. It just will move by other means that are not likely to be as safe uh, that will also generate greenhouse gases, or that this oil production moves offshore to a country that doesn't have the environmental protections we have, and you'll have more greenhouse gases. So again, I think that regardless of your perspective on what this, all of our, uh, depending on what you, you know, you're looking for, you're still not going to get what you want out of this, because if you were trying to prevent greenhouse gases, it's just probably going to be produced just someplace else. So if you want an energy independence, again, this is not going to help us with energy independence. So I think that this is bad for Nebraska, it's bad for our country, and certainly would encourage the Biden administration to relook at the Keystone Pipeline again. And obviously it's coming from one of our closest allies, Canada. Uh, Christina Stella, NET, some states say they're struggling to secure second vaccine doses to residents and anticipate delays in their state vaccine campa campaigns. Are you seeing and or expecting any issues getting doses from the federal government in the coming weeks? Uh, we're not anticipating getting any, having any problem getting doses it's just going to be the same doses. So I think we're going to be on a schedule for the next several weeks, you know, through the month of February, we're going to be getting the same amount of doses, both first and second doses, to be able to administer. And Angie kind of outlined the amount we're going to get, that 23,500, that means that we're going to be stepping through this in a way to get through phase 1B, but it's going to take some time to be able to get through that. But we're not anticipating any problems from the federal government on that. How do national supply demand concerns impact the state's ability to carry out its vaccination plan on schedule? Again, the producers, Moderna and Pfizer, produce the vaccines. The federal government does the allocation to us. We're not expecting any changes in allocation. Obviously, if they ramp up production, we would expect to see more, but that would be up to the federal government to allocate more to us. Taylor, do we have any other questions that were sent in? So uh, Julie Anderson from the World Herald is asking, it looks like Nebraska's position among states has slipped uh, to about 34th. So while we used to be much higher ranked, we're, we've dropped down to uh, that 34th rank. A couple things on that. Uh, first of all, I think there's a bunch of states that are in a tight category there, so within a certain percentage. So that may be part of it. But also, if you look, we received, I think, Angie, what, 44,000, some 46,000 uh, second doses late last week, which again, you have to, with, with the Moderna especially, you have to wait till the time that they're ready to do. You can't deploy those early. So you have to wait to get those deployed. And then we had some 65,000 in the federal pharmacy program that were unaccounted for. So I would expect that as we work through that federal pharmacy program and those stats get reported and we work through our way through the second doses, we'll, we'll see that change. But again, this is why we want to look at the dashboard and, and see if we can't do a better job of presenting that data so people can see, you know, where we've got uh, allocations to the federal pharmacy program, for example, uh, or where we've got second doses that we can't deploy yet that would, you know, not be able to be deployed. So we don't think that should be held against us that we can't uh, put second doses in when people aren't ready for them yet. So we're certainly going to continue to stay on top of it. Uh, on a, a call I was on with the local health departments last week, I know, for example, uh, the three health departments that uh, we're talking, the uh, Douglas. County, Lincoln Lancaster, um, and uh, I think it was either two or three rivers, uh, both said that they had used up all their allocations. So I think the local health departments are working very vigorously to make sure to, they're getting out those doses and using all up their doses every week at the allocation they get. That was probably a longer winded answer than you're looking for, Julie. Sorry. <laughs> Matt Oberding is uh, asking from the Journal Star, are there any plans to send Douglas, Lincoln, Lancaster more vaccines to help them catch up with the rest of the state into, from phase 1A into phase 1B? And the, the answer is that no, not really. Again, Lincoln, Lancaster, and, and Douglas are larger population counties, and so they had more people to get to. 
but they're getting the allocation based upon what Angie was just talking about, which is looking at the population of people who are 65 years and older. Before it was how many people do you have as far as healthcare workers and how many people do you have in long-term care facilities. So we're doing the allocation based essentially on population of those priority groups. And so they'll be getting a consistent supply, but it'll be about the same supply that they're getting. And the number is about 6,600 for Douglas County. Is that about right? And that's roughly 29% of the overall allocation. Is that right? So that, and Lincoln will get 3,900. So those allocations will stay consistent for the, the next several weeks until we see some sort of change with regard to the allocation from the federal government or as we start working our way through you know, phase 1B. So Grant from the AP is saying if it's going to take several months to get through phase 1B, does that mean everybody else is going to take longer? And the answer is it just depends on what kind of uh, allocation we get from the federal government. Obviously, four months is a long time. If we see additional vaccines get approved and we see additional uh, vaccines delivered to the state, obviously we're going to deliver those vaccines and we can bring that pipeline in. What we're talking about is just with the data we know right now, we have a fairly good confidence with regard to the allocations we're going to get weekly. and Given those allocations right now, absent any other changes, like increase from those or new vaccines, we're just doing the math, and that's what the math is. And Jeff Ross has a pretty good question. He says that earlier this week, I think you said in an interview, that the state would be finalizing a list of vaccination sites. As that list is finalized, there will be a release of that list of vaccination sites. And so Jeff Robb from the Omaha World Herald has a series of questions, so we can expect more after this one. The first was uh, Angie had talked about a, a list of vaccination sites. Uh, that the state was preparing, and is that uh, list ready and is it distributed yet? It's not distributed, but it's at the local health districts because they will see the list of where they're at. So uh, it has not been distributed yet, but you can check with your local health district because they will be the ones publishing that list of vaccine sites. Is that accurate? Um, potentially. Potentially. Uh, but, excuse me? So we can get more information. We'll, we'll get more information about where it will post. So the question uh, Jeff is asking, you talked about the lag of 65,000 doses, and specifically this is the federal pharmacy program, and that is because we actually don't have control of those doses. So the federal pharmacy program is that we, remember, we banked some of our vaccine doses that were then delivered to companies like CVS and Walgreens. So we never actually took possession of those. They were all given to CVS and Walgreens as companies, and then they had contracted with various long-term care facilities to be able to uh, you know, get to those facilities and do the vaccinations. Then because it's a federal program, they report back to the federal government and then the federal government reports it to us is my understanding. That's right, Nancy's, or, uh, Angie's shaking her head, yeah. Uh, so the federal government then reports back to us. So you can see there's a couple of extra steps to be able to get the information back to us. CVS or Walgreens has got to get the work done. They've got to then take that data and supply it back to the federal government, then the federal government's got to give it to us. So we've got the companies and the federal government that are in the intervening steps there to be able to get us the information versus when we deal with our local public health departments. So between those two steps, that creates about a two-week delay to be able to get that to us, and that's why you see 65,000 doses that we've banked with the federal pharmacy program not being reported back to us yet. And that's all he's got for now. Paul, Andrew, Lee, anybody? Come on. Paul, I saw your hand kind of go up. Uh, the question was, uh, what are my response with regard to Dr. Lawler's comments? Can you give me be specific with what requirements you're talking about? So Dr. Lawler said that uh, President Trump had uh, made an issue of wearing a mask and that uh, apparently Dr. Criticized Lawler's mask criticized mask wearing and so forth. 
downplayed the seriousness of the virus, not the vaccine, right? Right. So uh, first of all, I would disagree with Dr. Lawler on that. Uh, that is not my perspective of how it was. I believe it was actually Dr. Fauci who originally said, don't wear masks. In fact, I think that was also the CDC said, don't wear masks originally. And then they, again, changed their position either because they had additional data or whatever, or you know, masks became more available or whatever. So I don't know that that it would be fair to be able to blame that on President Trump. And of course, we've been talking about all, you know, all the different steps you could take to slow down the spread of the virus here for many months. And as a, my recollection is, it was the president who first implemented the 10 person rule on like, what was that, March 13th? I'm starting to forget how, but uh, it was the president who actually told everybody in the country to, to go to a 10 person rule right away. So the president took immediate steps, the president took immediate steps to stop airline travel. At the time, as I recall, also criticized by the Democrats that he was being xenophobic by you know, cutting off airlines uh, from other countries where they had high cases. So I, I would disagree 100% with Dr. Lawler on this. It looked, I think the president took quick action to be able to slow down the spread of the virus. It may not have uh, had this, the, done all the things that Dr. Lawler was looking for, but the president took quick steps on this. So uh, then Paul's asking, wasn't there a tape where the president said, uh, I didn't want to have people freak out, so I downplayed the seriousness of it. Uh, again, I think going to a 10-person rule right away demonstrates the seriousness of it. Andrew. So the question was, uh, Lancaster, Lincoln Lancaster has a website or a way to get registered for the vaccine. Douglas County has one. The state's going to be coming up one. Does that mean that there's going to be a hodgepodge here? And I would actually think about it. There's not going to be a wrong door here. As we were saying earlier, if you register on Douglas County, you don't need to register on the state. But if you do the state, that works too. So we will, you know, there'll be a number of different ways people can do it. It won't have to be a website. You can make a phone call. We're going to allow also, uh, I know local health departments are talking about having just uh, clinics where you can um, be able just to come in without ha you know, having to uh, use the website and that sort of thing. So there's going to be a variety of ways for people to be able to get the vaccine. And we're just, uh, you know, the, I think the counties had some systems to be able to move a little bit quicker than we did at the state, which we encouraged because we want to get people starting to, to sign up here. But we'll all coordinate the data on the back end so that we make it seamless. So the question was, did I monitor uh, how the clinic has gone at the Pinnacle Bank Arena today? And I have not. Angie, do you have any information on how that's gone? Uh, sure, Paul, so I'm not going to go there this afternoon. Angie Ling is going to go visit there this afternoon and get a, a firsthand uh, you know, witness about how it's going. So I don't have any information right now about it. Uh, will uh, some of the mass vaccinations occur in arenas like the Pinnacle Bank Arena? And again, it'll really be up to the local health departments to make that determination. Certainly in places like Lincoln, where you have enough population to make that work, that could be very successful. In other health districts where maybe you don't have a concentrated population, where the, con the population is more dispersed throughout the health district, that may not work. So it really is going to be up to the local health districts to decide what is the most efficient and effective way to get those vaccines out. So the question is, uh, Andrew says he's not an IT guy. Why is it taking so long to get the state uh, website up? And again, part of it is just working with our vendor to be able to get the contract put in place and then to be able to get the website set up. I don't know if Angie or Ashley, do you have any further questions? Yep, so we just have to go through the process of Picking up the, you know, picking out the proper uh, vendor and getting a contract negotiated, and all that, and then of course getting it stood up. 
And so the question is why were Douglas County and Lincoln Lancaster able to do it quicker? And I, I don't know the answer to that right offhand. Uh, I'd probably, I'd refer you to talk to either Pat Lopez or Audie Poor. Well, I think as we go back and look at, there's always going to we're always going to be able to find ways that we can make improvements on it. But remember, you've got a, a, a vendor who is working with multiple states, and so uh, you just got to go through the process. And they've got limited resources on getting their contracts done, and so we're at, in some ways kind of at the mercy of when these vendors are able to be able to respond back to us and get things set up. So Jeff Robb is asking what other pharmacies will be offering vaccines to the public as we move through some of these things. And Angie, I don't know, are we ready to talk about that at this point? Um, I can help. Yeah, you want to come up and talk about that? Great, thanks. So the pharmacies that we'll start out with are going to be some select Hy-Vee and Kohl's pharmacies. And then we also have some local pharmacies that we're working with in some of the more rural areas. And I don't have the list of what those are. The, there's a couple different ways that that came about is um, current contracts, or not contracts, but agreements with them. So we knew that they were able to connect to our system, they were able to store and administer correctly. And we wanted to start it smaller so we knew we can make sure that all the data is flowing correctly and then we can expand it as we go along. Um, another, if, if you don't mind, I'll talk a little bit about the registration system. So what the local health departments have are actually kind of like a stopgap. So they're really an interim process and it's a very basic process of getting people on a list. Those will flow into the state system and the state system will be a much more vibrant program that will have provider portals on the other side of it too. So not only uh, if I was someone who was administering a vaccine, I would you would be able to register, I would be able to look you up, and then I would be able to administer the vaccine using this product as well. So it's a much more complex process, not just a sign up, not just a sign up sheet. We also had to make sure all the systems connected on the back end. So Nessus is our immunization um, program, and so we needed to make sure that the program's connected on the back end, and that stuff takes time. We also do, wanted. Do I just get talk about Nessus? Sure. Ooh. <laughs> Nebraska. Nebraska immunization system is what it ultimately stands for. Um, and so that's our system where we do all our administration data in there. And it also connects with VTRAX. VTRAX is the system that does all our ordering and, um, and that's where we um, monitor our inventory. So all of those programs have to connect and so that takes a lot longer. And the systems that the local health departments have don't have any of that. So that's why we want to make sure, and they're not using them for administration either. So don't get me, don't get that incorrectly um, misconstrued. So they're using them as sign-up sheets. So um, it's really important that the information flows, and it will also in the future have a two-way flow. So even the organizations that won't be using the state system will be able to capture all their information through that as well, um, through a two-way. Uh, data flow. I'm talking outside my lane right now. <laughs> a two-way data flow from Nessus. So it's a very complex process. And then just a reminder as well, we, we looked at probably six or seven different vendors that wanted to do different programs with us and had multiple conversations with, with many of them. So we have been working on this for a while to make sure that we got the correct one, one that wasn't going to crash. Um, and so we've done a lot of a lot of work on this program and we wanted to make sure we had the best program for Nebraska and not just jump the gun and get a product that might not be the best. Ooh, I don't know when the contract was officially signed sometime here in January and then um, we've been working on this all through December as well. Ooh, I do not have that information. Yep, we can absolutely get that for you. I don't, I don't know. I don't think in the summer, because a lot of these products were not, were not made for this, right? So um, it's the same thing kind of with the testing programs. Those people are creating these programs as they come along. So we needed a product to evaluate 
to be able to make that decision. So these products are being created for vaccine administration specifically. Any other questions? Okay, great. Great, thanks Angie, appreciate the clarification on that. All right, other questions? Yeah, Paul. Well, so with regard to phase 1B, we've expanded the population. Uh, I think we've said it's about 500,000 is what you said total, and again, of 75% uptake, it's 400,000, so that significantly expanded the population of phase 1B. By definition, if we've got a fixed supply, it's going to take longer to get through that, and then ultimately that means that phase 2, which is the general public, is going to take longer as well. So uh, we are prioritizing the right people. It's the people who are going to be most at risk for this. And, and just continue to urge people to be patient. And of course, if we get additional vaccines approved by the federal government, um, you know, the FDA, that will allow us to be able to, assuming the federal government then allocates that to us, that will allow us to be able to speed this process up. Actually, I, I think that we, we are getting the allocations pretty much what we were promised ever since like the second week of December. So there really hasn't been a change to the plan. Uh, obviously, when we had a smaller group in phase 1B, we thought we'd get through that smaller, faster, but we've got a larger group now in phase 1B because we added those 65-year-old uh, plus category. So it's gonna take longer to get through, but it's the same number of people, right? We're, there's no more people in Nebraska that we have to go to. We're just prioritizing people who are gonna be more at risk. And so, Again, just for everybody else in phase 1B and those other phases, we just ask patient that we are focusing on the folks who are going to be more at risk. Again, when you look at that category from 45 to 64, the fatalities per 100,000 was 56, and it's almost 510 when you get over age 65 plus, so almost 10 times more. So that's why we're prioritizing those folks first, because they're greater at risk. And it's just, you know, the, the supply of the vaccine has been steady. If it goes up, then we'll be able to get through this faster. So, Angie, do we have any data on what percentage of healthcare workers are taking the vaccine? So, I don't have hard data for you. I can tell you directional data, based on what Angie has just told me, is that uh, in the metro areas, it's closer to, it's like 70 to 75 percent, 75 to 80 percent, and in the rural areas, it's more like 50 or 60 percent. So Paul's asking, is that a predictor for what we're going to find with regard to the 65 or year old older population? Just don't know. Possibly, just don't know. Uh, again, it just kind of depends. You know, certainly, I think we've seen good uptake in our long-term care facilities. So we'll, uh, you know, again, right now we're at the point where we're going to be trying to focus on the groups that are going to be at greater risk, and we're going to just get that vaccine out as quickly as possible. And we certainly encourage everybody who are on those groups to get signed up and get the vaccine. Do you have a percentage on the long-term care folks? Not right offhand. I just anecdotally, again, talking to some of the folks who are doing it, I think we're seeing pretty good uptake. So Andrew's asking, does that explain why some of the rural areas have been able to go to phase 1B? And certainly that's an impact, that if you have fewer people um, in your phase 1A that are taking the vaccine, that leaves you more to go on to the next phase. So that could certainly be one of the reasons why uh, some of the local health districts in the more rural parts of the state have been able to move more quickly into phase 1B. A couple, couple more questions. The, um, the president's promise of 100 million vaccines in the arms of people in, you know, 100 days, how much will, we have to see an increase in Nebraska for that to happen. So the question was, uh, President Biden has promised 100 million vaccines in people's arms over the course of the next 100 days. What kind of increase in Nebraska would we have to see to be able to make that happen? And 
I have not done the math on that, Andrew, so I couldn't tell you. I think that's an ambitious goal. I certainly hope that that is true, that we get that many vaccines out. But we can only act upon the data we've got right now, which is the data that Angie already laid out, which is we're looking at the foreseeable future that we're going to be getting that 23,500 a week in, of first doses. And so we'll be working to get those out as quickly as possible. And so Lancaster County is saying the only thing that's holding them back from getting more people vaccinated is supply. And again, that's consistent with what we've been telling people. If you give us more vaccines, we will get it into people's arms. So uh, and I've told that to uh, the federal government uh, as well. If you get us more supply, we will find ways to be able to get it into people's arms. One last question. Did I, the question was, did I find anything more out about Space Command while I was in Washington, D.C., and I did not have any additional conversations uh, with regard to that. We didn't have any interface with uh, administrative officials. Though I do want to highlight something that, again, what we got a chance to witness was the peaceful transition of power in our country, and that despite the tragedy of January 6th, which demonstrated that democracy can be fragile, it's also resilient that we saw that, again, the peaceful transition of that power on January 20th. I'd also point out that I think there were more Republican governors there to witness that transition than there were Democrat governors. Why was that important to you? To, I think it was important to, to show that, again, we're one country. We all wear the same jersey. We're all on the same team. Yeah, we have our political differences. I thought the president did a very good job, though, of saying, that every political discussion doesn't need to, to turn into uh, a fire that is burning everything down. That we've got to have a civil society where we can express our differences but still understand we're all Americans. And so as an American and as a governor, I thought it was important for me to be there to support the peaceful transition of power, which is what is one of the highlights of our republic. All right, great. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it. Again, please continue to remember Avoid the three C's, wash your hands, wear your mask, keep that six foot of distance. We'll be back again on Monday at 10 a.m. and then Friday at 10 a.m. next week as well. Wednesday next week I will be testifying in front of the Revenue Committee on our plan to limit how many property taxes can go up, how much property taxes go up in a given year. Thank you all again. Have everybody have a great weekend. Thanks, Angie. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Sharon. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Good seeing you. Good seeing you.